Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show, where you will learn how to get smart. Intellectual humility and critical thinking are what we're exploring today. My first guest is Professor Mark Leary who was the professor of psychology and neuroscience at Duke University. For more than 40 years, Mark Leary has studied psychology of emotion and motivation with an interest in processes that underlie human well-being and strong social relationships. And boy, oh boy, more than ever, we really need you now, Mark Leary. Thanks for joining (laughs) me on the show. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, it is a pleasure. It's a pleasure because I'm interested in this subject, and I'm also interested in something that you study and research, and that is intellectual humility. And I would love for you to describe this because that has become a set of buzzwords now. You see the term almost everywhere (laughs) in magazines and newspapers. Psychologists didn't start studying intellectual humility until five or six years ago in any big way, but it has really spread. I think people are intrigued about this idea. What intellectual humility is, it's recognizing that whatever it is you may believe, your beliefs, your viewpoints, your opinions, whatever you believe might potentially be wrong. Now, it never seems like we're wrong. It'd be silly (laughs) silly to hold a belief and say, I believe this, but it's wrong. Wrong? Uh, Are you wrong? (laughs) Right. Um, It never feels that way, of course, but logically we all realize, well, we can't be right all the time. After all, uh, maybe we don't have enough information or we have incorrect information. Somebody told us something that was wrong. Or maybe we just don't have the background knowledge or the intelligence to really completely understand some complex situation. The problem is most of us walk through life far more confident of our beliefs and opinions than we should be. There's a lot of research demonstrating that people overestimate, extremely overestimate how well they understand things. Intellectual humility is simply recognizing that no matter how firmly I might believe something, that could possibly be wrong. Doesn't mean we can't act on our beliefs. It doesn't mean we really have a lot of doubts. It's just keeping our eyes open for the possibility that we might be incorrect. What I find interesting about this is because most of us draw and form opinions based upon information that we're intaking every day that might not necessarily be true, right? We're getting information from a lot of different sources that may or may not be accurate. How do you suggest we learn to discern or activate more uh, critical thinking in order to become more intellectually humble? Well, I think the first step for any one of us is simply to reaffirm to ourselves consistently every day, I can't possibly know everything. How could I be right about everything that I assert? I mean, none of us could possibly know and understand everything to be right 100% of the time, or in our disagreements with other people. I think we all feel like we're almost always right when we disagree with others, but that can't be. Right. <laughs> we did a study a few years ago where we asked people, we said, think about all of the disagreements you have with other people, from very trivial things to important matters. Think of all the disagreements you have. And what percentage of those disagreements are you the one who's correct? And we said to him, you know, you know, sometimes you don't know who's correct. We just we just disagree and we argue about it. And we, what percentage of the time are you correct? The average person said that they were correct about two thirds of the time. That can't be true <laughs> on average. Yeah, some of us are probably correct more than others, but we can't all be right two thirds of the time. And if you keep that in the back of your mind, 
it creates some humility about your knowledge and your intellectual abilities that just cautions you, just cautions you to remember, you know, you might be wrong about this. So I think the first thing is simply to logically understand you can't possibly know everything and you can't possibly always be right. Another thing I think is to really insist, I think we need to enter a, a world in which we all insist that we base our decisions and our beliefs on evidence as much as possible. That's the criterion. Is the evidence we have out there always correct? Well, no, but let's really explore the best possible evidence for any particular decision or idea and insist that everybody else do too, because at least that's an objective arbiter, even though, you know, even scientific evidence is sometimes incorrect. But still, I would personally much rather go with evidence, yes. even if I, if I doubted it a little bit, than just making things, <laughs> making things up because I believe that they're true. And, and one last thing I would suggest is that we become more comfortable with not always having the answer to being able to say, I don't know, I don't have the slightest idea. Or here's what I think, but I could be completely wrong. Because if you really look inside yourself, you can get a feeling about how certain should I be about this belief or this opinion or this perspective. And when I do that, I realize that my beliefs are often on very flimsy ground. It's okay for me to have them. You have to have the beliefs to get by in life, to make decisions, to, to, to live each day. But there's nothing wrong with holding out some kind of doubt that hey, this could be incorrect. Keep reminding yourself, it's okay not to know. I would just love to hear people say they don't know more. Yeah. I, you know, people, just people, politicians, how often do you hear politicians and people ask them a question, they say, well, you know, I don't know. I'll have to look into that. No, they always have an answer. <laughs> Which <laughs> and, might not and, and even be correct. It may not be. That's absolutely yeah. right. In your work, you mentioned that there are benefits to being intellectually humble. And I would love for you to share some of them because I think they're pretty wonderful because it leads us to where most of us want to go, right? Which is that state of connection. Um, I, I think there's really three big categories of benefits. One is that I think we make better decisions when we have our eyes open to the possibility that our beliefs might be wrong. If you make all of your decisions in life believing that they're completely correct and they're based on correct beliefs, you're not going to be open to the warning signals that, in fact, you're making decisions based on incorrect beliefs. And, and so I think I think you're going to live a more high quality, successful life that meets your goals if you're open to the possibility that some of what you believe might, in fact, be incorrect. Second thing is, I think intellectual humility can grease social relationships a bit. We know we have a lot of conflicts with people about all kinds of topics. We disagree, we argue. And having intellectual humility allows us to take a little step back. Yes, we believe what we believe, but we can have more genteel civil conversations with people. If in the back of our mind, even though while I'm asserting my point, I'm thinking to myself, am I 100% sure I'm right? Does this other person potentially have some other good ideas? No, maybe I'm not completely right. Maybe they're not completely wrong. And I think that improves the quality of social interactions, certainly the quality of disagreements, even close relationships. Uh, we did research on married couples and couples in which the, the partners were low in intellectual humility were less satisfied with their relationships. They had more conflict. They dealt with disagreements in more dysfunctional ways. So it really improves the quality of relationships. And the third big category of benefits is, I think, in, in work life, in the business world, on the job, to the extent that employees in an organization and particularly managers and leaders have some intellectual humility, I think you're going to come up with better ideas. People are going to be more open to other people's perspectives and they're going to be able to collaborate better rather than people digging in and saying, this is what, what, what I think we should do as a business and you're completely wrong with what you want to do. Intellectual humility fosters uh, collaboration and creativity to some extent. So there's, there's a whole host of benefits to not being so sure of yourself. And there's something else that comes to mind, and that is um, intellectual humility teaching us to work with our egos. I, I think that's true to some extent, because if you really watch yourself, you can see that you've gotten ego involved in this discussion. We've all had that 
happen to us, where we can realize that we're losing it over some argument, often that doesn't make any difference. And we're insisting that we're right, even while this little voice in our head is saying, calm down, it's not a big deal, your ego involved here. It really doesn't matter whether you win this argument or not. And, and that's silly to, to hurt our relationships with others and cause conflict over things that don't matter because we want to be correct. Well, and that's a bit of competition, right? That it doesn't matter what it is, that the, the, the need to feel that you must come out on top every time is a losing proposition in terms of life satisfaction. Oh, it's ab- absolutely true. Intellectually humble people are perceived as more agreeable and easier to get along with. I want to stress they're not pushovers. When some people hear about intellectual humility, it just sounds like somebody who's kind of mushy and doesn't know what they believe and they're just sort of stumbling through life uncertain about things. And and that's not what intellectually humble people are like at all. They have beliefs. They have values. They will assert themselves. But still, there's this little voice in their head saying, you know, you could be wrong about this. And that tempers their reactions to disagreement. It's funny. We have a, a phrase around here. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? (laughs) And then usually people say, I want both. I'm like, no, pick one. (laughs) Yep. You you only get one choice. I I would like to clarify that dichotomy a little bit, because when we say I want to be right, there's two senses in which we can can interpret that phrase. One is I really want to be correct. Yes. I really I really want to have the right answer. And there I would say, yes, I really do want to be correct. I want to have the right answer. And what's interesting is intellectually humble people are highly motivated to be correct in that internal mental sense. Um, That's part of why they're so intellectually humble, is that if you really want to be correct about something in your own mind, if you want to have the right beliefs and viewpoints and opinions, you have to be open to the possibility you're wrong so you can continue to correct any inaccurate beliefs that you have. So that kind of wanting to be right is perfectly fine. And intellectually humble people want to be right in the sense of actually being correct. The damaging part that that interferes with (laughs) happiness is I want other people to think I'm right. I want to win this argument. It's a social kind of rightness that may have nothing to do with whether or not you're really correct. So intellectually humble people can separate those two things a little bit better. I want to be correct. I really do want to understand what's going on here 100 percent. But I don't really care that much whether I win the argument or not. I don't care whether I'm socially correct. Got it. We're going to need to take a pause. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with Professor Mark Leary. To learn more about Professor's work, please go to, uh, this is at Duke EDU. It's sites.duke.edu slash Leary, L-E-A-R-Y. I'll repeat that. It's sites.duke.edu slash Leary. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Before we take that break, I want to ask a question. Have you ever thought about how and why thought trends lead to the innovations of tomorrow? Every day, a little bit of science fiction becomes science fact. From self-driving cars to computers in our pockets to predictive artificial intelligence, it all begs the question, what will our futures look like? Audible and South by Southwest have teamed up for a new podcast, Futurology, 12 Big Questions About What's Next to explore the future of everyday activities like how we'll work, what we'll eat, our longevity, and mindfulness. Futurology explores questions like, is college becoming obsolete? How long is too long to live? Will we all be eating jellyfish someday? Futurology features conversations with experts on the leading edge of 12 Big Questions. Listen to the first four episodes now only from Audible. Go to audible.com slash futurology. That's audible.com slash F-U-T-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y. Here comes that pause. We'll be right back. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit harvestinghappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. Welcome back. Let's continue the conversation with Mark Leary. We're talking about getting smart, intellectual humility and critical thinking. Let's get back to it. Mark, why do people have such difficulty recognizing their limitations in this area? Uh, There are a few reasons. 
people in general are simply too overconfident in their beliefs. And it's part of a bigger pattern that most people are overconfident about an awful lot of their abilities and characteristics. There's a lot of research showing that most people think they're above average on almost any quality that you can think of. Are you above average in terms of being a nice person, of being a good employee in your job, of being considerate, of being kind, being moral, of uh, being a good driver? Everybody says, yes, I'm above average. Well, that's impossible, of course, because half the people have to be below average on, <laughs> on these things, right? Yes. But it's like 85 to 90 percent of the people believe they are above average on almost every everything that's been tested. And, and even people who say, well, I'm not really good at this. You still find that they think they're a little bit above average. You don't hear people saying, no, I'm way below average in my competencies and I'm, I'm below average at work and I'm below average as a lover. And no, everybody thinks they're above average on these things. Intellectual arrogance is just another manifestation of this a better than average effect that everybody thinks that they're in some sense smarter. And I don't mean like more educated, but that they can figure things out and they have their finger on things and understand what's going on better than other people do. So part of it is just this human characteristic that makes everybody want to believe that they're better than average. Second, it's so hard to know what you don't know. So I can feel like I'm really informed about some complex issue, some complex political issue, for example. I think, yeah, I really understand this. But the problem is I don't know what I don't know. And so everybody <laughs> overestimates, Fact. right? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you can't fault people for that. You can't know what you don't know. But it does make us all more confident that we've got this thing figured out better than we really do. The third reason some people have so much trouble with intellectual humility is that it's unsettling, even anxiety producing, because you have to be able to tolerate a certain amount of uncertainty and ambiguity if you're intellectually humble. Because mm -hmm. what you're saying is, I believe this, but you know, I could be wrong. I'm going to keep my eye out for the possibility I'm wrong. Some people can handle that to sort of hold their beliefs tentatively. Other people really dislike that. They don't have a tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty. And so in order to feel like they can get up in the morning and get through their day, they have to believe their beliefs very, very firmly, or it's just anxiety producing. So there are a number of things that enter into this. And I think people differ in why they have trouble with intellectual humility. The intellectually humble person has to put together a package of things of recognizing I can't be better than average on this. Certainly, I don't know things, even though I don't know what I don't know. I recognize that I don't know, and I have to live with the uncertainty. And, yes. and I think that's why it's such a challenge sometimes. There's so many things working against recognizing that you may be wrong. Well, I think the reframe here, you know, the way maybe to be open-minded, and again, I, I, know, I know that I don't know everything, is like, how curious can I be? How willing can I be, or we as humans, to sort of cross the divide and say, you know, this is what I'm thinking, but tell me more. Like, I don't know. Tell me what I don't know. Show me what I don't know. That's a really important way to approach it, particularly in group settings, um, when you're having conversations with people or you're making group decisions at work, to be really upfront. Here's what I think, but tell me why I might be wrong. Yeah. Now, Maybe you're not wrong. The things people say to you, if you ask them, that might not be correct. But if you're non-defensive and at least open to the possibility that maybe they're offering something to you about what you don't know, it's going to help the decision process. It's going to increase your intellectual humility. And what I'm sensing is that this process leads to greater interpersonal harmony. It, it, it allows for conflicts to be diffused. A absolutely. Particularly trivial conflicts. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to give the impression that there's, you know, there's not a time to stand your ground and tell somebody they're completely wrong. I mean, you, you know, there, there's certain things where, you know, it would be insane for me to say, well, you know, I think that, you know, killing innocent people in cold blood is wrong. But, you know, I could be wrong about that. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> a hard wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so there's certain things that we have to we believe that is a red line kind of thing, and we're going to be entrenched in it. And and we have to be, I mean, to be moral, principled people. Mm -hmm. So I don't want listeners to think that you just give up your commitment to some of your cherished values. 
The problem is we treat a lot of things that are relatively trivial as if they're those red line kinds of issues. And we defend them like they're red line moral issues, and they're not. We're arguing about what was the best NFL team ever, and we get in a fight about it. I mean, <laughs> again, we can have that kind of discussion, but how can I be so certain that my answer is right and it doesn't matter anyway? I hear you. I, I hear you. And it's and it, um, it's it's head scratching sometimes when we're in social settings and people are so sure that they're sure and they're right. And then they learn that they're not. And then they eat crow. And then it, it, that 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 also has ramifications. <laughs> yes, it does. Wouldn't it be nice if we sort of rearrange things in the way we think about this, that it ought to be a really good thing to be shown that you're wrong? Yeah. It's not good. It's not good you were wrong necessarily, but you ought to be grateful to be shown that you're wrong. You're better off now than you were before you made a fool out of yourself. Now that sounds very inhuman. I can't do that, but that's sort of the ideal world in terms of really everyone doing their best to really get a grip on what is the truth. What are the accurate things we need to know? The only way you're going to do that is to be open to other people showing you that you're wrong and not to be defensive about. So is there anything that we can do to increase our intellectual humility? Is there anything that any exercise, any skill boosters that you can can share with us? That is a great question. Research is just beginning on that. Um, there are some schools that have been developed, private schools that focus on fostering intellectual virtues, uh, not just intellectual humility, but also just openness in general or tenacity and learning and things like that. And they claim, and there's not hard evidence on this, that yes, at, with, when you're dealing with kids, you can begin to teach them intellectual skills that lead them to value taking an intellectually humble approach to knowledge. Um, so I think we can change it. I think parents can role model intellectual humility by admitting when they're wrong, by showing kids that, well, yeah, I will change my mind if you present me with clear evidence to the contrary. Um, I think developing a norm where we base our decisions and our discussions on the best possible evidence that we mentioned a little yes. earlier, I think mm. is very, very important uh, for everybody to say, well, let's, let's take a look at the evidence. Now we can argue about the evidence. Scientists do that all the time. We, you know, we fight with each other about, you know, well, did you do the study right? Yes. You can raise questions about the source of evidence, but having those discussions in a non-defensive way really does help advance our own personal knowledge about things. When I was a kid, I was a member of the debate team. And I think those debate teams have gone out of style. But when I was a kid 100 years ago, it was a pretty respectable way to learn some of these skills, right? Yes. And in fact, they was assign you topics you didn't believe. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I had public speaking classes in high school where you had to get up and argue points you didn't believe. And what I almost always found is that in preparing a talk against something that I thought I didn't believe – or thought I, I talk against something that I did believe, I realized that my belief was was not as firm as I had thought. I could begin to see holes in it. You didn't necessarily throw it out the window, but you had a more nuanced view. I think the other thing you can do, thinking about nuance, is to recognize that knowledge is nuanced. It's very rarely this versus that, particularly when you get to opinions. This is right and that's wrong. It's not that clear cut. There are shades of gray. Can we be more open to picking the best ideas that I have and putting them together, the best ideas you have and somebody else's, even though we don't completely agree with each other? If we can be open to sort of cherry picking the best, I, I, I think we'd, we'd get along better. I think so, too. And, you know, I, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about this idea that uh, we should question the things that we think, see, hear and feel like we we often take those as fact, as gospel, when in fact they're quite arbitrary. Absolutely. They're very constructed in our minds. Our brain makes up stuff, <laughs> puts pieces together in ways that are just really not logical, but we firmly believe them. We make the firm decisions and, and reach firm conclusions based on very partial evidence. It doesn't take much evidence to form impressions of people, to reach conclusions about things. Uh, we walk around making really firm decisions without much information sometimes. So I think the bottom line is that we need to 
and investigate or be curious, investigate and look for evidence. That would be a big help in my view. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And, and not be ego involved. To have yeah. the mission be, I want to understand the world as best as I can and all its complexity. And I don't mind being corrected if I'm wrong or sometimes juggling multiple viewpoints that don't fit very well together. I believe this, but I also believe that it doesn't quite fit. That's OK. Maybe that's the way things are. Uh, we don't have to be as sure of ourselves as we often are. Professor Mark Leary, thanks for joining me down today's show. To learn more about Mark's work, go to sites.duke.com. Dot edu slash Leary. I'm going to say it again because it's a little unusual. Sites.duke.edu slash Leary. Thanks for joining me today. I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thanks so much. Let's take that break. We'll be right back. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness. And follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. And we're back talking about getting smart, intellectual humility, and critical thinking. My next guest is Professor Lee McIntyre who is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University and History of Science at Boston University and an instructor of ethics at Harvard Extension School. He holds a BA from Wesleyan University and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Michigan, formerly executive director of the Institute for Qualitative Social Science at Harvard University. Lee has also served as a policy advisor to the executive dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, and as an associate editor in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. And he is the author of How to Talk to a Science Denier, Conversations with Flat Earthers, Climate Deniers, and Others Who Define Reason. Lee, I am so excited. I'm going to just, yay, Lee is here. <laughs> He's going to help us. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure because this is a hot topic around our dinner table. You know, it, it is a hot topic around a lot of dinner tables. That, that's kind of part of it's why I wrote the book, but it's also the burden of the book because I, I want it to make a difference for a lot of people. The interesting thing is that you started writing this book before COVID-19 hit. So this was in the hopper before sort of the great global lockdown. How did the pandemic change your thinking, if it did at all? It's interesting. I had the contract to do the book, and I had planned out the book, and finally signed the paperwork on March 20th, 2020, <sighs> which was you know just about when lockdown began. And the first thing I told my editor was, okay, but now I want to add a chapter at the end on COVID denial. And he said, well, but there is no COVID denial. And I said, wait. Because COVID denial, I knew just from what I already knew about science denial, would be exactly the same as anti-vax, as evolution denial, as flat earth, as climate denial. They all follow the same blueprint of reasoning. And the interesting part and the horrifying part is that I got to see COVID denial be born uh, right in front of me uh, following along exactly the script. Wow. Wow. Let's talk about some common characteristics of a science denier. Well, some cognitive scientists before me came up with this idea of the blueprint that was followed by all science deniers. And there are really five steps in it. First, they cherry pick evidence. Second, they believe in conspiracy theories. Third, they engage in illogical reasoning. Fourth, they rely on fake experts and denigrate real experts. And fifth, they insist that science has to be perfect. Those are really the criteria, and you can tick them off. Just as I was saying them, you were probably thinking, does COVID do that? Yes, 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 uh, it does. And uh, in the book, I am at some pains to show that this template uh, fits with all of the different topics within science denial. And the fake experts that you speak of in point number four, there's one thing I've noticed about these folks is that they are very clever with social media. 
Well, they are. In fact, <laughs> there was a, a study uh, a reported in NPR recently, which showed that uh, 65% of the anti-vax propaganda on Twitter was due to 12 people. And those 12 people, you know, not only are very, <laughs> very clever with Twitter and very prolific, if you drill down and you do a little bit of research, you often find that they have an interest in this. Either they're selling alternative health products or, you know, they, there's there's something, you know, if you dig into their history, there's some reason to, you know, to make you a little suspicious. So that I always find that fascinating because amongst a group of folks who are already conspiracy theorists, why don't they dig in a little bit on some of these folks? Now, I'm not calling the, you know, the they call them the disinformation dozen. <laughs> I didn't call them that, but that, that's what they're called. I'm not claiming that they're fake experts. Some of them are, in fact, medical doctors. But there are difficulties, if you want to put it that way, in uh, how and why they're providing the information that they are. Well, it's interesting you know, I'm looking at the list because I've written it down for myself and I'm the, the, the fake expert thing is pops out to me because I have somebody in my orbit, not a family member in this case, but somebody who is an older woman who is a COVID denier and she subscribes to all these sort of underground videos. And I think it's part of the disinformation dozen that, that mm -hmm. you're speaking of without naming yep. any names. And yep. in fact, some of them have been on the show for other projects in other eras, <laughs> I have to say. But when I do the deep dive on who's producing this stuff, I see that it's all like MLM style propaganda. It's upsetting, isn't it? When, you, when yes. you dig down a little bit and you find that. And, you know, there are a couple of interesting things to note here. One is that people don't call themselves deniers. They no. call themselves skeptics. But, and I'm a philosopher, so I take that seriously when people say that they're a skeptic. But being a skeptic doesn't mean that you're able to just turn it on and off depending on whether you want to believe the thing or not. Uh, if you're a skeptic, it means that you're waiting for good evidence. And, you know, pe people will make that claim. But then why don't they use the same standard on something that they do want to believe? It's the double standard. It's what I call cafeteria skepticism, <laughs> where you often find deniers uh, being really hard on scientists, you know, on things that they don't want to believe, but accepting gullibly with no evidence, something that they do want to believe. So that's... Uh, that that turns out to be a, a real problem. And the other problem that you just mentioned is, you know, folks who are propagating propaganda, uh, some of the lies, and science denial is not a mistake, it's a lie. Some of the lies that are going around being amplified on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube uh, are the result of a deliberate a disinformation campaign. These are not things that just, you know, people happen to be worried about or, you know, somebody woke up one day and said, hey, what about this? It's something that a group or organization or a person uh, came up with and thought, I'm going to feed this out and try to convince people to believe it because it serves their financial or ideological or political interests. Yeah. Let's roll on over to the flat earthers for a moment. In this day and age, how do you prove to a flat earther that the world really is round? It cannot be done. And, and I say that, <laughs> oh, no. and, and I say that having gone to a flat earth convention and understanding two things. One is that no matter what you say to them about of a factual nature, they will have a reason why it's unreliable. There's a conspiracy, the data were faked, it's not a real picture, you know, there, there will be some reason. But the other reason is a, a much better reason, which is that nothing can be proven in science. It, it, science is not about proof. Science is about overwhelming evidence. Science right. is about warrant, probability, strong, strong probability. But when you talk about the ability to prove something, that's to defeat every single skeptical view that you could have. And since I'm a philosopher, I take the, you know, skepticism very seriously, as I've said, Descartes, uh, you know, the ultimate skeptic thought that maybe we could be dreaming right now. Maybe there was an evil demon who was deceiving us. 
David Hume, another you know very strong skeptic, more or less showed in his work that there is no way to get causation from correlation, that you've never seen a causal connection, you've only seen a correlation. And what that means is that there's no way to have proof. So, and this is part of the misunderstanding that science deniers have, the, the fifth trope in the, the blueprint, science has to be perfect. So often flat earthers would say to me, prove it, prove it. And you can't play that game because that's to buy into their misconception that science is about certainty or proof. Instead, what I want to do with them is talk about the way that they're reasoning. Yes. And let's talk a little bit about reasoning, because when I look at sort of the plethora of domains of this flat earthers, climate deniers, anti-vaxxers, extreme writers, whatever. Is there a thread? Like if you are likely to subscribe to one, you mm -hmm. are also likely to believe in these other things that are completely different doors, right? Yeah. To go through. But is there a correlation of that? It's interesting. I've been looking for this for years and I have not found one, not politically, not demographically, you know, because you might think, well, you know, if you're going to go all the way to believing in flat earth, you're probably going to believe in climate denial. Not so, because oh. most of the climate deniers that I spoke with thought that there was a dome over the earth, which meant that, you know, we more or less live in a terrarium. <laughs> and so that most of them believed in, in climate change. So you can't, I mean, there are certain correlations. People who were anti-vaxxers are probably more likely to be, you know, against the COVID vaccine. So, I mean, there, there are certainly correlations, but it somewhat depends on why the person has picked out, remember cafeteria skeptics? Mm -hmm. Why have they picked out that particular thing to be skeptical of? And sometimes they're skeptical against one type of science, but not against another. Well, it seems to me that the, the cafeteria skeptics, and I love that term, buys into someone's fuzzy logic. And we all do have fuzzy logic about different things, right? It's, it, you know, we're not always linear about everything. But for example, um, when it comes to the COVID vaccine, there are a lot of people who don't have right leaning politics, who don't believe in the vaccine, because they feel like if they can just keep their immune system strong, naturally, they're not going to get sick. You're right. And it's important to realize that folks who are against the vaccine exist on a spectrum. Yes. And not all of them are people that I would classify as deniers. Now, some of them, they're the audience. They can become deniers if they're not careful because they're subjected to mis and disinformation. But in some cases, I mean, it's important to remember that anti-vax in general is based on fear. Yeah. People are just, they don't want to hurt their children. They don't want to hurt themselves. If you're looking for a reason not to take a vaccine, uh, you can probably find it. You can probably find, you know, some report somewhere, you know, of some person who's, you know, not representative of, you know, the type of health that you have who had a bad reaction. Or if you just look at the VAERS system, the online self-reporting system, you'll find plenty of bad reports there. But of course, that's unvetted. Those are just, and sometimes, you know, people just put in phony reports. So it's this built-in cognitive bias that we all have of a uh, motivated reasoning or confirmation bias where we just want to be right. We want to look for the thing that's going to back up what we already feel is correct. To me, that's one of the brilliant things about science because science is a way of keeping ourselves honest where we say, I'd like to believe that this is true. But when I went out into the world and I performed the experiment, I found that it wasn't. Therefore, I'm going to change my beliefs. Mm -hmm. That's humanity at its best. Yes. I, I mean, I, I <laughs> have such great respect for that because it's so hard both as a culture and as an individual to do that. Because as you point out, we all do have our weak spots. Yeah. And guess what? Those weak spots are built into our brains by you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. And so it's very hard to turn them off. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with my guest today, Lee McIntyre. We're talking about his newest book, How to Talk to a Science Denier, Conversations with Flat Earthers, Climate Deniers, and Others Who Define Reason. 
To learn more, please visit leemcintyrebooks.com, on Twitter at Lee C. McIntyre, and on Facebook, that page is Lee Cameron McIntyre. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back, and that is a promise. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H-Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. Getting Smarter with Professor Lee McIntyre. We're talking about intellectual humility and critical thinking. Let's get back to it. Lee, let's get back to this fun conversation because it's serious good fun. We're being very serious about the subject matter, but it, you can't help but have a good giggle. Well, uh, about some topics. <laughs> <laughs> And it depends on the circumstance. I, I don't feel much like laughing these days about about COVID. And President Biden was right. People are losing their patience and it's getting kind of ugly out there, isn't it? It is getting ugly out there. Let's do a little thought experiment here. If you were to go to an evangelical church in the Deep South to try to persuade mm -hmm. the congregants to get vaccinated, what is the first thing that you would say or do? The very first thing I would do is listen. Yeah. I wouldn't. There are no magic words that you can say to anyone to convince them to give up their position on a closely held belief. And so it would be hubris uh, to think that I could just go in there to a group that I'm not a member of and say something that would make them all just kind of magically change their minds. So I think I would listen and I would look for some sort of uh, common ground. And then after I'd listened for a while, usually that moment comes in a conversation where people will say, well, what do you think? Or don't you think I'm right? And then that's my opportunity to ask a few questions. I've had more luck in asking questions than anything. When I was at the Flat Earth Convention, I didn't tell them facts. And I, I didn't really tell them uh, what I thought, though they knew what I thought. I would just ask questions uh, to try to reveal if there was an inconsistency in their logic. You know, well, if you believe this person, why don't you believe that person? Or, you know, why do you trust this evidence, but not that? And so I think I would, I would listen a lot, spend some time and maybe come back more than once, because that's really your best chance. Science denial is about identity. And yeah. you're, if you're getting somebody, if you're insulting somebody about their beliefs, you're insulting them as a person. And so I would want to build trust. And the way you build trust is through respectful, calm, patient conversation face to face. I think the asking question part is really important and listening, like, you know, shut up and listen kind of thing, because mm -hmm. we all get to our positions through our own experience, right? The, the lens of, of our lives and the stories that we have to tell about that. And at the end of the day, the science deniers or the people that we meet who don't share our beliefs, their desires for their lives are not different than ours. And I think that's an important that's right. thing to remember. That is exactly right. I mean, I have said more than once to folks, anti-vaxxers love their children too. Yes. They just don't have reliable information. And if there's anything that could give you empathy, I think it's this. A lot of science deniers are victims they're victims of a disinformation campaign that is used to try to dupe them into being confused or, you know, uh, having being cynical or having doubts about things where there is not really scientific doubt. And that's killing us. It's killing them. Uh, COVID is the scourge that it is now 
because of disinformation, yeah. because of this you know, insidious campaign to try to get so many people to doubt the efficacy and safety of the vaccines. Or even the existence of the disease to begin with, right? That it's just a little cold yeah. or a little flu. And yeah. the belief, well, you know, if masks worked, why didn't they tell us that from the beginning? But it does speak to your point of number five, right? The science must be perfect, right? The story was unfolding right. in real time. So we didn't know at the beginning. No. And you know what? It's good that scientists change their mind. Yes. Because when the evidence changes, what would you want them to do? Not change their mind? <laughs> I mean, as they learn more, the recommendations change. And I think that that's... Now, to the mind of somebody who's a conspiracy theorist... That sounds like lying. That sounds like a reason to distrust yes. them. Because if they knew the answer, then why didn't they give it to us? But see, again, that's the wrong view. That's the idea that scientists discover the truth with certainty and proof. And, you know, well, if they thought that they were certain and they could prove it in the first place, why did they change their mind? They must be lying. But no, that's not what they were doing. They were telling you the best recommendation based on the current evidence. But then the evidence changed. As it should. <laughs> yes. And as their, their mind should change it. I think it was John Maynard Keynes, uh, the economist, said, when the facts change, I change my mind, sir. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Yeah. That is a really great quote. I want to talk a little bit about another book that you wrote called Post-Truth mm -hmm. and how it relates to our discussion today. Yeah. So I wrote Post-Truth in... Um, 2017, it was published in, in early 2018 before COVID was uh, even on the horizon. But there is a relationship between post-truth, which I define in the book as the political subordination of reality, and science denial. And here it is. I think that 60 or 70 years of science denial um, was so successful about climate change, tobacco causing cancer, you know, all these things where people raised doubt where there really wasn't any or shouldn't have been any. It was so successful that it led, you know, unscrupulous uh, political types to look at it and say, you know, if they can do that about factual matters that have scientific backing, we can lie about anything. And they did. Yeah. They lied about anything and everything. And here's the really the sad part, but also fascinating to a scholar to the subject. It's the same methodology. It's the same blueprint. Illogical reasoning, cherry picking evidence, conspiracy theories. It's the same thing. Look at the Stop the Steal campaign. Look at the yes. people who are claiming that the insurrectionists on January 6th were actually members of Antifa. It's the same reasoning strategy that's used by the flat earthers and the COVID deniers and the climate deniers. Identical. You know, it's the uh, the world of alternative facts, right? Yeah, I couldn't believe she said that. Uh, it was right out of central fasting, wasn't it? And then oh. Giuliani later saying truth isn't truth. That that was just a that was a narrative born of the 1950s campaign, a public relations campaign when the tobacco companies got together and decided to fight the science. They didn't fight the science with science. They fought the science with public relations. They provided an alternative narrative based on their alternative facts. And where did those alternative facts come from? The precursor to the American Tobacco Institute. Very, very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about the antidote. That being, I'm speaking of education. <laughs> yeah, I think that education is part of it. I wish that they would teach kids critical thinking skills, you know, how to spot fake news. And I mean, they do in some cases. This is something that I discussed at the end of Post Truth, a fifth grade teacher who was at something called the fake news game, you know, where they, they would train kids to, you know, to learn how to be little skeptics and, you know, think like scientists, like scientists actually think, not like we're, you know, taught in science class, where uncertainty, failure, you know, we, we need to be skeptical, we need to be critical. But I, I only think, I think that that's only part of it. Because I think that right now, science denial is so widespread that we cannot educate ourselves out of the problem. 
And even though I've written a book called How to Talk to a Science Denier, I'm not completely sure that we can talk our way out of the problem. Mm. I've been thinking more and more these days about the, the problem of disinformation, where it comes from, and how it's amplified. The social media companies have played an enormous role in making science denial worse because uh, propaganda all by itself really can't do much. It has to be propagated. And the internet does that beautifully. Uh, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are the source for a lot of the uh, science deniers. It, it is the, uh, YouTube is the gateway for flat earth. That's where almost everybody that I spoke with who was a flat earther had been radicalized was from YouTube. That's very interesting. YouTube is clamping down on the sources for some of this science denier business that's going on. I mean, a lot of the sources of the fake experts are now being yes. terminated, which I, I read I, that. I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, on the other hand, then you get into the whole free speech debate. And but if you're not disseminating responsible information, mm -hmm. you know, it shouldn't be out there. Well, they're private companies. They can do what they want. The First Amendment protects uh, us against governmental censorship, not against uh, Facebook uh, kicking us off its platform. But the, the other problem is this. Some people have said that the antidote to bad speech is good speech, except that in that kind of a marketplace, nobody's going to hear the good speech. It gets drowned yeah. out. And th I think there, there's actually empirical evidence out there. Uh, there was a study in Nature Human Behavior in 2019, which showed that you can talk to science deniers and even make some progress in convincing them, but that it's not as good as them never having heard the disinformation in the first place. Here's, here's if I could boil it down. Once liars have a microphone, they are going to do damage. Oh. And so for the people who say you'd be hurting free speech, I I say, but look just as, uh, as importantly at the alternative, which is that if you give a platform and a microphone to a liar, you're upholding free speech, uh, you know, allegedly, but at what cost? You know, are you doing real damage to truth? And isn't that the, the point of free speech, the point of protecting free speech? I mean, if it's not just a difference of opinion, if it's not just a values question, but it's a factual question, like these questions about, you know, whether the uh, COVID vaccines have microchips in them. <laughs> should somebody be able to say that, you know, from a mountaintop? Uh, should, we, should we give them a microphone? Should we not only allow that, should we encourage that? I think the answer is no, Agreed. because that's a, a debunked conspiracy theory, and we need to deplatform that sort of speech as quickly as possible. No, I agree with you. It makes sense to me. And I think that's the other part, you know, going back to the critical thinking element and it, teaching critical thinking in our schools, which, yes, some schools are teaching it and some are not. Right. Because that's right. the belief is that, you know, that parents should be able to raise their kids up the way they want to raise them up and give them a vaccine or not give them a vaccine or propagate truth or not. And yes. I think that's the hard part. Well, and there's a perfect analogy here which is that part and parcel of evolution denial for the last 40 years has been that they want to teach creationism in the public schools, which they have now rebranded as intelligent design. Right. But the idea is give us a platform, free speech. We, we, we teach the controversy, they'll say, you know, maybe, maybe evolution is true. Maybe creation is true. Let's put it in the biology classroom and let the students decide. That's the danger. Yeah. Oh, my. So much to do, so little time. And and there is no um, right. full answer, right? I mean, it's it's the continued debate. And I think having conversations, doing the deep listening, asking the questions and, you know, rinse, repeat, practice, rinse, repeat, practice. I think that there are a couple of different things that we need to do. Unfortunately, the first two about the disinformation, the amplification are at the governmental level. The third thing that we can do, though, as far as some, um, you know, as individual citizens, is keep an open line of communication with the friends and family members that disagree with you, the ones who don't believe what you believe, the ones that you think are wrong about COVID or about climate change. Because what the anecdotal literature has shown 
is that even hardcore science deniers, every science denier that I've ever read an account of who has changed their mind, it's been as a result of personal engagement with somebody that they trust. So if we prune away those people who disagree with us, we're removing the opportunity to influence them. And although it may not work, even if, if it doesn't work in most cases, the idea is, I think, that if all of us would just embrace the people that are in our own lives, that we know trust us, we could maybe do some good. I agree with that. And I also believe that I'm speaking for myself. It's more important to me to be in relationship with those people, even though my viewpoints differ, mm -hmm. than to not. Like I value the connection more. I, th I think that's right. I think that's important. And it's also important for a, a reason that I don't talk about very often, but it's, I think it's right. Science denial is not someone else's problem. <laughs> it's our problem. And it's, it's our problem because we need to fight it, you know, the allies of science, but also because I'll bet if you probe enough, each of us have some area of belief that's not quite in line with the scientific literature. And we're just kind of blind to that one. You know, we'll think, you know, oh, yes, no, I understand. I, climate change is real, you know, and I understand, uh, uh, you know, the, the truth about vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. But you probe a little bit deeper and you, liberal or conservative, each of us have some area where, you know, our beliefs are not completely in line with science. And that's worth thinking about. That's worth having somebody in our life that keeps us honest about that. That's true. Point well taken. I'm thinking about, you know, going outside without a jacket when it's cold because you'll catch a cold. <laughs> that's been debunked. <laughs> yeah. But, but who are you to tell your grandma? Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I say it to my own kids, you know, even though I know it's not true. Isn't that silly? Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. Every time I, I, I'm a sucker for that, every time I see quizzes on stuff like that, you know, the, the things that you thought were true, but, you know, since childhood, but aren't really true. And, you know, I'll, I'll always take that quiz and look at that stuff. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. Come back, hang out anytime. Yeah, this has been wonderful. My guest today has been Lee McIntyre. The book we've been speaking about is How to Talk to a Science Denier, Conversations with Flat Earthers, climate deniers, and others who defy reason. Please visit leemcintyrebooks.com, on Twitter at Lee C. McIntyre, and on Facebook, Lee Cameron McIntyre. Lee, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress-Kamen on behalf of my guests, Mark Leary and Lee McIntyre, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember... Happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with TogiNet Radio, KBUU RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.